planning is bringing the future into the present so that you can do something about it. Tonight, we're going to talk about retirement. We're going to talk about the difference of Roth versus traditional IRAs, some different types of investments that you can do with them, you know, self-directed IRA versus regular, some prohibited transactions, and a couple case studies. At the end, I'm going to give you a free gift, no obligation. I think you're going to like it, so stick to the end, and uh, you'll see that free gift. So as we know, right now, people are somewhat excited because banks are averaging about 4% if you put your money in with them. Um, the problem is that inflation is 3%, so we're really not gaining a whole lot with that. And you have to be taxed on that 3%. So obviously, we know that going to the bank, putting our money there is not actually as safe as you might think. Last year, so many people were like, well, I'm just going to sit on my money. I'm not going to invest it. And some people were so excited to tell me that they got 4% on their money. But then, you know, if you look at the reports, the reports say inflation is 3%, but we know it's a little bit more than that. They really didn't go uh, ahead. Actually, they started going broke slowly. And so not a good decision to just sit on the sidelines. So, you know, let's uh, say that in the stock market, you save a million dollars. That's kind of what people say. You should save a million dollars. And you know what? You get an 8 to 12% return on that in the stock market if you're following the S&P. The, the common rule of thumb, though, is when you retire, you can take out 4%, which is like $40,000. I don't know how many people in the Bay Area can live on $40,000, but that would go pretty fast in the Bay Area. And... Remember, when you're taking that out, you're actually kind of taking the golden egg, like you're taking your principal and you have to pay taxes on it. So for those of us who have been in real estate and real estate investing, we know that this really is the way to create the retirement income that we want to live on. So if you had a million dollars worth of properties free and clear, easily you can get eight to 10%, probably more, but I'm just being conservative here. And even if you didn't take all of that, you only took 85% of it, um, that's 76,000. That's already more than the 40,000. And if it's set up properly, that's coming to you tax-free, partly because of depreciation, or as we're going to talk about in a self-directed IRA where you pay taxes on it, you can live very well um, on real estate in self-directed IRAs. Okay, so we just, we know real estate should be part of your plan. Now, we hear about Social Security and it was put in play, you know, really um, coming out of the, the Great Depression to help create jobs by having the older people retire and create jobs for the younger people. And honestly, it wasn't even created to be permanent, but it ended up turning into a permanent um, and then it expanded to include disability insurance and survivor's benefits and Medicare. Well, we know that it's facing huge strain. Um, money has been pulled out of it. It's always an ongoing political debate. And basically we know we cannot count on it. Don't set up your future relying on social security. So we need to do it on our own. Now, additionally, with all of what we've been through with COVID and, you know, various spending packages, we can see here that our debt is a tidal wave. We are now at 119% GPD. GD so let me see if my screen is here. So right now, the federal income tax is at 37% except for your Roth and your IRAs, um, you have to pay 3.8% uh, on investments. And this tax plan is going to be reevaluated in 2025. Now we have an election coming up. So we know that, you know, there's going to be a lot of talk about this, but with that type of uh, debt that we're incurring and having the GDP at 119% of the debt, 
There's already rumors that they're looking at increasing the tax rate, not just on corporations, but also on individuals. And they're also looking at changing the taxes on the Ross and the IRAs. So my encouragement is if you're not already using these self-directed IRAs and Roth IRAs, that you get them set up now so that you end up getting grandfather claused in before they start making changes to this. So the government will likely increase our tax burden in order to cover the debt. So how do you plan? We need to consider using tax advantage tools like the self-directeds. Now, a lot of times, um, you know, we talk about 401ks, traditional IRAs and Roths. Tonight, what I want to do is I want to take you out of the traditional arena and move you over to the self-directed arena because you can have all of these same retirement vehicles but you can have them where you are actually directing what you're investing in more than just the stock market. Oh, okay, hold on a second. I have to move something on my screen so I can see this. So, you know, obviously one of the key pieces to retirement planning is estate planning. You can set up IRAs where they pass on to your children, um, either taxed or untaxed, depending on how you structure that. So that's a key piece. Typically, you get to see higher returns because depending on which vehicle you're using, you're growing it tax-free or um, you're growing it after tax and you're not going to have to pay taxes on it. So those returns end up being higher. You get the long-term appreciation, you get diversification, and if you're doing 401ks, you can get employer matches. This is certainly a way to hedge against inflation. There's, you know, we've already talked tax advantages and the compounding growth. It's sort of like, you know, if you plant a seed and the seed you've already paid taxes on, and it grows and it creates all the fruit with additional seeds that you're not paying taxes on. Imagine the compounding growth you'd get on that. That's what the Roth IRA does for us. And then by choosing to manage these, you can end up having financial security and it's not a fearful thing. I have to tell you, so many times I would talk to people who have the 401ks through their employers and it's kind of like they planned on retiring with a hope and a prayer. They would get the statement. They would look at it and see, did they go up or down from last month or last quarter? And then they put it in a drawer. They never actually took that and made an analysis that if it keeps growing at that same pace, is it going to be enough to get to retirement? And honestly, a lot of the 401ks that people have are sitting with employers that they're no longer with. So those could actually be converted into IRAs. They could be converted into self-directed IRAs, and then they can make a plan to make sure that they're earning enough that they can actually retire. So we're gonna compare a little bit about traditional IRAs and Roth IRAs. This is whether it's in the regular arena or self-directed, they're the same, okay? So, with a traditional IRA, you can set up an IRA at any age up to 70 and a half. With a Roth IRA, you can set up a Roth IRA at any age. Now, again, the way it works is the Roth IRA, you pay taxes on the income you earn before it goes in, and then it earns in there tax-free, and when you pull it out, it's tax-free. The traditional IRA is a tax deduction now. It goes in and earns tax-free, but when you pull it out is when you pay taxes on it. So the traditional IRA, tax deductible, yes. The Roth, no. So based on your income, you can put in various amounts. Um, you know, like up to 6,000 per year. And the Roth IRA, there's certain amounts that are set by the law each year. 
Okay, non-deductible contributions, yes and no. Withdrawal tax, this is an important one. When you put money in to your traditional IRA and you try to take it out before you're 59 and a half, you will have to pay a tax on that. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. This one isn't the penalty to withdraw. This is actually when you take the money out, you're paying tax on it. So again, on the traditional IRA, when you're taking that out to live on or to pay your bills after 59 and a half, you are paying taxes on that. When you take the money out of the Roth IRA, you are not paying taxes on it because you already paid taxes in the beginning. Minimum age for distribution, 59 and a half. It's the same. Mandatory distributions. The traditional IRA requires that you start taking money out at 70 and a half. The Roth IRA, you're not required to take money out. That may be helpful if you're trying to avoid pulling too much out so that you don't get pushed into the next tax bracket. It's good to have that. And then the minimum age for distribution um, is 70 and a half and then nothing for the Roth. So which is better? If you think the Roth IRA, we're gonna have you raise your hands. If you've got your camera on here, we didn't set up a poll for this one, but if you think that the Roth IRA is better, raise your hand. If you think a traditional IRA is better, raise your hand. Okay. Well, it's a trick question. <laughs> They're actually both better. They're better for different scenarios. So that's that might have been why it was a little bit difficult to answer that. So there's five kind of hard and fast rules of which one to use. I suggest you set up both because they both could be used. You know, if your tax bracket is expected to go up, then you can use a Roth. If you think that you will have more assets in the future that you can draw from, like cash flowing real estate, use a Roth. If you're in a higher tax bracket, then when you retire, you're going to be in a lower tax bracket, use a traditional, right? So let's say you're in a higher tax bracket now. And as you make a contribution, it helps lower your taxes now. And then when you retire, you may be in a lower tax bracket. And so you get taxed less on your withdrawals. And then they sort of say that Roth accounts actually benefit younger people because they get to compound that interest or compound that growth untaxed. I think it's sort of like, you got some coins in your right pocket and some coins in your left pocket, and you pull on whichever one you want based on what your tax situation is. So I think you should use both. So with these, what can you invest in? Most people assume you can only invest in stock, but actually with your retirement accounts, your Roth IRA, your traditional IRA, you can invest in everything and anything except these few items, such as collectible art, certain coins and metals, some are allowed, some aren't. You can invest, you cannot invest in life insurance. You cannot invest in personal use real estate. Now I wanna make this clear. It's not uncommon for people to buy a, uh, let's say a beachfront property or a golf course property in their retirement fund. And they think in their mind, well, I'll just go there on vacation. Okay, that's not allowed. But what you can do is you can buy it in your IRAs and you can rent it out until you retire. And then once you retire, you can take it out as a distribution. So it is a way to acquire it 
but you can't use it personally until you have taken it out of your IRA once you've hit your 59 and a half. You can't invest in alcohol beverages. You cannot invest in derivatives and options. You cannot invest in S corporation stock. You can do in C corp and you cannot invest in gems or jewelry or non-qualified precious metals. So can you invest in a car? Probably not. It doesn't qualify. I mean, uh, you know, that's one of those things where you'd have to really work with your custodian. Um, but can you invest in promissory notes? Yes. Can you invest in real estate? Yes. Can you invest in land? Yes. Can you invest in options? Now here it says derivatives and options, but what about land options? Absolutely. So those are some good tools that you can invest in. So here is just a little chart, kind of like, you know, if you're working with a regular IRA company, you know, like a Charles Schwab or some, whoever's left, I don't remember who, who they combined with, um, you know, you're going to be limited to stocks, bonds, mutual funds, whatever they have, like their bankage and brokerages. And um, it's usually pretty simple. Like you fill out a few forms, you send the money, you choose what you want to invest in, you can check it online. And it's easy to manage, but you don't always get the best investments because in each of those, somebody's charging fees. Now, if you move it to a self-directed IRA company, the self-directed IRA company will charge you fees on the full amount that you have placed with them but you're not getting nickel and dimed on the investments. And again, you can go into a wide range of real estate and various types of precious metals that are allowed, private placement memorandums, and you have greater control on what your future is gonna look like because of the investments that you're in. Now, there are certain rules like self-dealing, who you can invest with, things like that, that could cause it to be a prohibitive transaction. So you need to have the right custodian um, that's well-educated and the right tax advisor or CPA helping to guide you. So self-directed IRAs offer the freedom to capitalize on your own interests, knowledge, giving you control over a diverse range of alternative assets. And that comes from U.S. Money Reserve. So self-directed IRAs, you know, they offer a great deal of potential for growth. Um, just the key thing is to manage those within the rules and the box that the IRS gives you. So typically this is done through a, a company or custodian that is set up to help you with the paperwork and the management of it. Um, they give you control. So there's some custodians or companies that let you have checkbook control, meaning you set up an LLC and your money is put into the LLC for your IRA and you can write the checks yourself of what you're investing in. That one is under a lot of scrutiny. So I would almost say, don't do that. I would say work with a custodian that makes it easy for you to work with and to send the payments and such that you might need without you actually writing the checks yourself. Okay, so here's just some of the things that people with um, the self-directed have invested in. Um, you know, obviously we're talking about real estate. Uh, you can invest in private businesses, um, options, you know, lien, tax lien certificates. Um, those are always so good. Private lending opportunities. That's probably the biggest place that I see people with IRAs use that and limited partnership shares. So those seem to be the two that fit working with your IRA the best. There are some people 
that you cannot transact with. And it's super important to understand this. If you are working with a disqualified person, it basically creates a disqualified transaction, which they call it blows up your IRA. It is no longer within the IRA rules. So this is why it's really important to understand this. You cannot do transactions with yourself. That means if you buy real estate, you can't stay in that real estate. That's considered self-dealing. Um, you cannot do transactions with your family members. I will show you some exceptions to that. Uh, fiduciaries, controlled businesses, um, controlled family businesses, or beneficiaries, like your you know, beneficiaries and your trust. So the whole idea is that your money needs to be placed with somebody separate from you to grow. And with the self-directed, they're giving you some autonomy in deciding what you're investing in, but not necessarily taking that money and using it for your personal benefit now and growing it for your future. You know, the, the idea is that they're giving you tax advantages now, so you can't use the money now. Okay. Now, as far as who, like in your family, it's sort of like, um, if you think of an up and down line, you cannot invest with anybody in your up and down lineage line. So your parents, your children, your children's spouse, or your spouse. So that whole line is pretty much disqualified. But if you go sideways, like your siblings, you can do that. Aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews, um, all of those are allowed. Now, additionally, like your cousins, um, you know, somebody will, will say, well, what about a stepchild? You know, like you had kids, she had kids and you got married. Can her kids be somebody you invest with? If you have not adopted your stepchild, you can invest with them. They are considered not in your lineage. So now the whole thing is like you can't manage what you invest in. So if you buy a house, a piece of real estate, you're not allowed to manage that real estate. You need to hire a manager. The same thing, like if you invest in a, a business, you're not allowed to manage that business. That's why you can't do controlled businesses. Um, so really it is a passive income investment. Think of it that way. And so one of the easy buttons we talked about earlier was mortgages and um, notes, things like that. That's an easy way because really you're not managing anything. You're placing the money and you're getting paid on it. But a lot of the money is made in active deals. Now you can't be in the active deal as an active participant, but you can be in the active deal as a passive investor. And so we call that a limited partner. So limited partners in real estate have, um, it's a great choice for IRA investments. You know, limited partners is a business structure that's set up with a manager or a general partner, and then the limited partner. The general partner is the active participant. And so the limited partner receives the benefits of the work that the general partner does but they have limited liability and they really are passive, which meets the criteria of, of the IRAs. So it fits the control issues. Um, returns are often, you know, in the double digits, better than stock market returns. And it allows you to diversify out of some traditional investments. So I'm going to put a pause button here. <laughs> this is the pause button saying, hey, stop. Uh, if you were around, um, I did a, a series on due diligence. The first thing I want to say, and this is my big thing is due diligence. Investing has risk. You always want to do diligence on the investments. Make sure you understand that. Then have to ask yourself, does this investment match my plan? Because 
it may sound neat. It might be shiny and sparkly, but its direction may not match your goals. So you really have to understand that. Make sure you're playing within the box of the IRS rules so it doesn't become disqualified and you have to pay taxes on everything. Make sure you're talking to your CPA and tax professionals on it. Now, um, back earlier in this series, I did a full episode on due diligence. Go back and watch that. Also, if you stay to the end, I'm going to give you a free resource where I wrote a chapter on due diligence. So what are the risks of investing in a limited partnership? It's usually liquidity because the money that you place into it gets placed into other investments. Um, you don't necessarily have control. The GPs are running it. And so make sure that they're trustworthy. And you have to look at what is it that you're investing in? What is the concentration risk? Is it like you're investing in an apartment building that's located in a particular area. So it's one asset in one area that has a concentration in that area. Or is it a fund that's spread across multiple areas and multiple assets? You know, understand what those risks are. So just doing a comparison, you know, if you were to do a self-directed IRA, going into some real estate, um, doing a mix of limited partnership, maybe doing some notes, it's not uncommon to see at least a 14% growth rate. Uh, traditional IRAs are performing anywhere from 8 to 10%. And so just looking at the difference of what that looks like over 30 years is substantial. So I want to share with you a case study. Um, this is a, a sample. When we get to the end, I'm going to ask a, a poll question. So watch for that. So John, he, you know, he owns a fix and flip business. And he has a hard money lender that reimburses him when he installs materials that he buys. So for example, he's going to redo the kitchen. And um, if he spends 15000 on the cabinets the lender won't reimburse them until those cabinets are installed. So then he gets them installed and the lender gives him the money back for that. And then he can buy the flooring. And so he's turning his money, but you know, he's not getting reimbursed until it's installed. This is not something that typical banks can lend on. And so he's taking about six months to do every flip just because he's got to wait for that process of buy it, install it, get the money back, buy it, install it, get the money back. And he does a calculation and he realizes that he could turn his uh, houses over in 90 days if he was able to buy all the materials at once and have his guys install it and then have the bank reimburse them as they're installed. So now he's been talking to his friend and his brother and both of them have retirement accounts with large balances in the stock market. You know, and they talk about losses here and this and that, and they express to him that they want to diversify. So he proposes an IRA, a self-directed IRA solution. He talks his brother and his friend into creating an LLC. Their, their self-directed IRAs fund that LLC. Then the LLC loans money to his company. And you know, he's, it's a five-year loan. He pays their LLC with above market rates and he's able to do double the amount of money or double the amount of business. So the question coming up in the poll is, is this a good deal? Let me see here. We can launch that. So the question is, is this a good idea? Is this a good Idea or bad idea? Okay, we're gonna give it five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. 
So most of you said it's a good idea. One of you said it's a bad idea. Is his brother a prohibited person? Can he do business with his brother? Yes. Yeah, actually he can because his brother is a sideways relationship, not an up and down relationship. Now, if this was his brother and his dad, that would have been bad. Now, this is actually a very good structure for using self-directed IRA money, um, putting it, you know, two people putting it into an LLC so that um, they can combine their funds and then loaning it and getting paid. It, it's a great use. Um, they are not actively participating in the projects. I actually think it's a good idea as long as he knows um, what he's doing and he has good communications with his brother and friend. Now it might be bad, you know, if something goes the wrong way, uh, but overall for business, this is good and it's allowable. So let's take a look at another case study here. So Sarah sets up a, a Roth self-directed IRA for her son. And he contributes 15000 to it over the last couple of years. And Sarah knows that him getting into real estate would make a big uh, impact on his future. But he's only got 15000 in the account. Now, you can go out and get loans to pair your IRA with. Um, they're not easy. And it's in this capital market, I don't even know if it's possible. But technically it's supposed to be allowable. Um, but one of Sarah's mentors has got a seller financed duplex, meaning there's no bank out there. Um, it's non-recourse. So if it goes south, they're not going to come after the IRA or anything like that. And he's willing to sell it to Sarah for 250,000 at 6% interest. Like he just wants to go on the beach and enjoy the rest of his life not having to deal with tenants and toilets. He just wants an easy exit. And one of his strategies is to sell it interest only so that he can avoid paying uh, capital gains for a little while. So the house is rented and it cash flows 3,800 every month. And the seller is only asking for 30,000 down. Now the problem is her son only has 15,000. So Sarah also has a Roth IRA and she has more than enough to cover the 30,000, but she wants her son to get in on the deal. So she writes the contract up to the seller with the buyer being both her and her son's Roth IRAs, each being 50, 50. They pass the money from their respective IRAs to the seller. They hire a property manager to manage the property the manager splits the income and sends it to each of their accounts. At the end of five years, they sell the property for $350,000. And again, the profits are split between their accounts. So it kind of looks like this, you know, after all the expenses, the painting, the carpet, you know, paying um, trash and things like that, they net $133,550 over the five years. And they only have to pay... 75,000 in debt. The sales proceeds after paying everybody was about 65,000. So it was 123,000 that they earned over five years. That's split 50-50. If you take a look at that, that's like 411% return on their money over five years or 82% per year. Now, that's a good deal. So the question in the poll is going to be, is this a prohibited transaction? So let me pull up that. Is this a prohibited transaction? Okay, this is not a prohibited transaction. 
Now it might be confusing because son and mom are linear, right? Which makes it sound like it's prohibited. The thing that makes it not prohibited is that they're both going into the transaction at the same exact time as tenants in common, basically. They're both going in as tenants in common. They're not doing work together. They're doing work side by side. And so this is an allowable transaction and totally one that they should do if they can get those kind of numbers. So we had here that uh, three of 38% said yes. And 63% said no. So you guys know your IRA rules. That's great. Okay. Again, nobody's going to provide retirement for you. Um, using these tax advantage accounts are going to be critical, especially as the tax rates are going to be going up. We just know that that's going to happen. And using them as self-directed gives you more control opportunities for higher returns as long as you pay attention to the box that the IRS has for those rules and regulations. So some people ask me, you know, what's the best uh, Sidra company out there? There's a lot. And they all do something a little different. They all have different types of fees depending on the size, depending on how many transactions you do. So I have a list here for you. Um, I suggest talking to each one of them and kind of talking to them about the scenarios. Like I have X amount of money. I want to do this much in a Roth. I want to do this much in a traditional IRA. I want to buy X, Y, Z, whether it's invest in limited partnerships or you want to do mortgage loans and notes, or maybe you actually want to own the real estate in your IRA Whatever it is, talk to them. How many transactions are you going to do a year and figure out what the costs are, the support they're going to give you and set it up for your preferences. So here it is. You guys can get a free book written by um, Michael Gray. Michael Gray uh, is a member of SJREI. Uh, he is a CPA and he is very much into using your Roth and IRA accounts for investing. This book was updated in 2023. It's very detailed. I suggest that all of you go ahead and download this. If you were to buy it on Amazon, it's about $40. So it's free here. Just uh, head out to sjrei.org, register now, dash free book. And we'll put that in the chat for you too. And this is the book that I also co-authored um, on chapter six. It's called Look Before You Leap. So that's free for you. Go ahead and sign up for that. Also, if you want, if you've got questions, um, I'm here and available to do a, a strategy call with you. No cost. Just set one up here at www.callwithlori.com and we'll get that uh, booked and we'll have a conversation and see if I can't be of value for you. Okay, so this is the time for you to raise your hands and ask questions. You can either raise your real hand or your virtual hand. All right, Chuck and Liz, I don't know who's there, but go ahead and unmute. We have um, property and self-directed IRAs and we're get, I'm getting into a bit of a bind with RMDs. The cash flow from the properties isn't keeping pace with the RMDs. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what strategies you might know of for dealing with that situation um so you want to you want to explain what rmd is the required minimum distribution yeah af after you reach a certain age and the age keeps changing 
Um, and the amount, the, the amount that you have to take out is based on the value of the account the previous December 31st. And um, the, 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 the factor of what you have to take out keeps going up as you age. Mm -hmm. So it, and, and the property, the, the asset value keeps going up. And so you're sort of chasing a, a, a nice monster. Yeah. Because and, if you if you sell it, then you've got to pay the taxes on that. Right. And and I've heard of selling a portion. Because mm -hmm. if you sell the whole thing, then you've got a huge tax bill. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only thing that I could think of is that maybe you sell a portion of it or, um, you know, could you do seller financing uh, where you sell it seller financed and they pay in enough that's more than what you need to take out because like right now people can't get finance so maybe there's a way you could work that and that's an interesting thought thank you yeah um the other one is maybe you could convert it to a roth take a look at what that would cost or look like in a conversion You know, tax wise, that's basically the same as selling. Yeah, true. Except that it stops now, but then it can continue to grow and you haven't sold it, right? Like you pay the taxes now, but it would stay in your ownership and continue to grow without any further tax consequences. Just a thought. Good. Other questions? Is that Rick, are you asking a question? Yeah, can I ask a question, please? Yes, of course. Okay, so let's say I have I have cash uh, in, in my IRA and I would like to put a percentage of that uh, that down so that I can buy another property. Mm -hmm. The question is, you know, my IRA doesn't have a credit score. Can, is it possible to get a loan in your IRA? So before the current capital market, there were lenders that would do um, SIDRA uh, loans. So one of the qualifications of the loan is it has to be non-recourse. Um, most of the traditional loans, like you sign up our recourse, meaning that if there's a deficiency, they could come after you. So that's the first thing is it has to be non-recourse. Most of the time it has to be a commercial type loan because it's really not based on you or your credit score. It's based on the IRA. And with the current capital market, I have not heard of anybody that has gotten one through an institution. Now, there is potential to get one through seller financing. So that's kind of the example I gave is if you had a seller who was selling, they could be your lender um, as long as the loan is structured properly for your SIDRA. Okay. Well, yeah, that, that's the problem would be finding a seller that would want to do that. Um, but that's good information. So basically, you typically would need to pay for it all cash correct correct okay thank you yep or you can do like lease option that would be another way sounds complicated yeah it can be <laughs> <laughs> and that is often why you know promissory notes mortgage notes um or investments in limited partnerships funds things like that are typically how people are using their iras Okay. Thanks so much. Yeah. Awesome. Other questions? If uh, I have a choice of doing self-directed IRA, both in IRA or Roth IRA, I should prefer Roth. Is that right? So I say maybe. Um, Definitely, it's going to depend on your situation. If you've got other assets or other places that you can get cash flow from, 
and things can grow for a while within your Roth tax-free compounding tax-free. That's definitely beneficial. Um, and then also when you take it out, it's tax-free. So there's advantages that side, but if you're in still a, a major work mode where you have a high income now, it may be advantageous to go into the traditional so that you can get that tax break now and then withdraw later at a lower tax bracket. Yeah, got it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right. Any other questions? All right, Kevin. Hi, Laura. Uh, I have two questions. One is that um, I have some uh, uh, company uh, common stocks. So is it possible that I can do the uh, self-directed uh, RA to, to uh, that I can transfer into that account so that in the future, when the company gets sold, then uh, I can get uh, to be lower tax rate most likely not because you have controlling interest in the company. Uh, so what about I'm an employee of my former my former employer, so I, I don't have the controlling okay. uh, that, that much. May, yeah, the, that, uh, that may be possible. Um, and that's something that you'd want to talk to your self-directed custodian on the mechanics to make sure that that's possible. Um, depending on how they're incorporated as a, hopefully a C corporation and um, right. putting that in there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, for and, sure. And, uh, and my second question is that if I want to split uh, to, uh, to, to allocate certain percentage of my uh, uh, self-directed RIA, uh, so, uh, sorry, the uh, traditional RIA, uh, first step, I need to switch it to self-directed and then uh, what are the options that I can make uh, uh, the investment in real estate? I never did that before. Yeah. So um, the first thing is you would set up your self-directed. You would take a portion of your traditional over to your self-directed. And then in that self-directed, you can invest in things like, um, like you could be a lender on somebody's property you could um, put money in as a capital partner. Let's say that somebody is going to do a fix and flip and you're going to share the profits. Um, if you have enough money to buy a property, all like pay cash for the whole thing, that's an option. Um, it used to be you could marry your money with a loan, but there's just nobody in the capital market right now. I mean, it'll probably come back. But right now, the only way that you could actually own a property without buying it cash is if somebody's willing to sell or finance you or you can do a lease option on it. Um, you can invest in funds or limited partnerships. So there's a lot of different opportunities. You know, like let's say that um, there's a large ap apartment complex that somebody is syndicating and you can buy in for 150000 You can do that with your self-directed IRA. You could put the 150 in your self-directed and then invest in that. And then when it comes back, it all goes into your self-directed. So from the, uh, uh, from the San Jose REI uh, website that I can find some opportunities uh, listed uh, there? Yeah, we don't list our opportunities there. If you want to talk about what we have available or some of our associates, just um, book a strategy call with me and then we'll talk about what fits your profile and where you're going and what you want to do. And we'll see what we have. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody tonight for your time. And uh, again, go out and get that free book. It's in the chat there. Um, and also, if you want to book a strategy call with me, go ahead and do that at callwithlaurie.com. We look forward to seeing you next week. We are starting a series next week. Um, we're going to talk about real estate development success secrets, how to accelerate your wealth. So basically, fix and flip properties or anything that we add value to is called development. It's developing the value. <laughs> so we're going to have an eight-part series talking about that from start to finish and how you can participate to accelerate your wealth. So, and also... And always, if you have any deals that you, you know, just came across and you're thinking might be something that we can help you with, 
feel free to reach out to us. You can email us at deals at fundingfaceoff.com. Until the next perfect time, have a great week. Take care, everyone.